please silence your cell phones and buckle your seat belts. I will be your host and perhaps a moderator for the next 90 minutes as we explore a most frightening question. Have we passed the tipping point on climate change? As is customary for Wonderfest, our, guidelines in this explore, our guides in this exploration will be two experts who can offer somewhat different and complementary vantage points on our question. Diane Grinick, Grinick, oh no, Grinick, is a national expert in environmental issues, particularly those involving energy production and use. She is now serving a six-year term of office as commissioner for the PUC, the California Public Utilities Commission. That term extends to the end of 2010, 2009, the end of 2009. I believe so, 2009. She earned a bachelor's degree in human biology from Stanford University and a Juris Doctorate, a JD, from Georgetown University. Also, we have Dan Kamen. He's professor in the Engin Energy and Resources Group here at Cal. He is also professor of public policy at the Goldman School of Public Policy, professor of nuclear engineering, and he is the director of RAIL, the Renewable and Appropriate Energy Laboratory. I actually wonder which of these two individuals has a busier life. It's got to be a, 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 oh, a tough contest. Professor Kamen received his bachelor's degree in physics from Cornell and his PhD in, in physics from Harvard. Um, our good speakers today have agreed to divide their dialogue into three parts, as is customary. During the first half hour or so, they will present background material to clarify the title question. In the second half hour, they will ask questions of each other and discuss the more controversial aspects of climate change. In the third half hour, you get to, I hope, rise to either of these two floor microphones and ask the hard questions. Please welcome our first speaker, Diane Granick. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, thank you. I can't actually believe that you've all given up your afternoon, given what a gorgeous day it is outside. And sort of the question is, could we just adjourn now and go outside? <laughs> but um, uh, it's really great to see you all here because this is such a critical question that Dan and I are going to be addressing, which is climate change, that I personally believe it is the single most important um, issue that we in California, nationally and internationally, uh, need to address. I think we need to address it way beyond what we're doing now. And um, in response to the central question that we have, which is, have we passed the tipping point? Um, what I come down is, I certainly hope not, but we need to do everything that we can to avoid passing the tipping point. And frankly, even if we are worried that we are there, we've got to do everything we can to mitigate and minimize what are the consequences. So let me just get, get started. That you may wonder what on earth is a commissioner of the Public Utilities Commission and why would I be here talking about climate change? So I'll be just real quick. The California Public Utilities Commission is a state agency. Um, we're actually located in San Francisco and we oversee and regulate the state's utilities, which includes the electric, natural gas, telecommunications, and water that are privately owned. So for you here who are served by PG&E, as an example, we regulate and oversee them. The um, charge that we have is to assure that the consumers and the businesses that are served by the state's utilities are assured adequate and reliable service. And we also are charged with ensuring that the utilities themselves are financially healthy. So that's sort of the traditional background of my commission. And that's the way that pretty much the commission had operated for about 150 years. It's one of the oldest commissions. But several years ago, we actually started to put some of the pieces together of thinking about energy and energy that's delivered by your local utility 
and what we need to do to be thinking about addressing climate change. And what we came to understand at our agency is that one of the major emitters of causes of carbon emissions is actually from the electricity that is produced. That, you know, the lights in this room are not just something that's out there unconnected, that you have a very complex whole system of wires that then end up going to trans major transmission lines that you see when you're driving and see those on the ridge, and ultimately then end up with the power plants. And depending upon the source of power from the power plants, whether it's coal or whether it's natural gas or whether it's nuclear or whether it's hydroelectric or whether it's wind or whether it's central station solar, there's a vast difference in how much carbon is emitted from the, electric, from the power plants that feed the electricity literally ending up in this room. And there's another component to that which is if you design a building or a room or a factory to be super energy efficient, you're using less electricity, less energy, and therefore you're cutting down on the carbon emissions. So once my agency, as well as many, many others, started to think in this larger picture, it became quite natural for us to think about we need to take a very strong, decisive leadership role on addressing climate change. The amount of money that the commission, my agency, oversees in terms of rates and programs um, is actually larger on an annual basis than the entire California legislature. So the reality is that we not only have a critical role to play in terms of thinking about carbon emissions, but there actually is a fair amount of economic aspects to it as well. The stick. <laughs> Hold on, we're having technical issues. <laughs> How long do you want me to keep talking, Dan? <laughs> no. Hours. hours, hours. We'll stop soon. Um, so what my agency then decided to do once we understood the context was to be very, very affirmative about we are going to try to structure all of our decisions and all of our policies to be trying to promote actions that will deal with climate change. And we're quite happy that we are, we think, in the forefront of other agencies around the country doing this, but we're seeing more and more, more other public utility commissions of all the states, because every state has them, say, look at we are a critical piece of thinking about the electricity, which is a major source of emissions, and how we can deal with climate change. And then, of course, we work very strongly with the governor and the legislature and everybody else in California that's trying to address climate change. My particular area of specialty at the commission is that I'm the lead commissioner on energy efficiency. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. I had done an awful lot of it in many, many areas before I was appointed by the governor um, just about three years ago. And so this is a real passion for me to be thinking about how we can go further and further and further in energy efficiency. The, there's two significant things to think about with energy conservation, energy efficiency. The first is that when we're talking about what steps we can take to address global warming, it's just about the only tool that we have in our toolbox that will actually save money. And that's because when you don't have to build a power plant, when you don't have to build a transmission line, because you're doing things more efficiently, you're saving money. And we need to be doing as much efficiency as we can in addressing global warming because the savings we're going to have from that is going to offset what we know are going to be a lot of costly things that we're going to have to be doing to changing our lives, changing the economy to address global warming. So it's really the significant step we need to do to keep all of the economic balance together. The second thing is, is that it's just smart in terms of 
um, people and how you live to do energy efficiency. The rule of thumb for California is that for every dollar we invest in energy efficiency, that for example, I assume that we've got energy efficient light bulbs in here, but if you went through and changed them all out and put them in, if you looked at the windows in this building and said, are they really the highest efficiency? Are they what we call dual paned windows? Um, all of that costs money, obviously, to do. But the, the rule of thumb, as I said, is for every dollar you invest in energy efficiency, you save two dollars. And so it's, in fact, one of the largest economic development programs we have in California. Because in California, we are running the world's largest energy efficiency program. That, again, my agency, we've put in a very small charge that if you're PG&E rate payers, you're all paying for it in your monthly bills. But that then adds up that everybody who's paying that charge is collected in a very large fund, and then my agency oversees how the utilities and many, many others are spending it. Right now, the California utilities are spending about a billion dollars in terms of energy efficiency. And so that is, again, one billion dollars. It's the largest program in the entire world going on. Let me just start with a little bit background to um, flesh out some of the things that I've talked about. California is the 12th largest emitter of carbon, and that's why we take it so seriously in California dealing with carbon, that we have a lot of resources that we can put at our disposal to do it, and by reducing our emissions, we really can make a difference worldwide. We passed here in California two years ago now um, what is an incredibly important law, if you haven't heard about it. It's the Global Warming Solution Law. We call it shorthand AB32, which stands for Assembly Bill 32. And what it does is it requires, it's not voluntary, and this is one of the um, very important things, is it is mandatory that here in California by the year 2020, we will have reduced our greenhouse gas emissions down to 1990 levels. Now we need to go much further than that, frankly, if we're really going to deal with global warming, if we're going to avoid the tipping point. But we became the first state in the country to adopt a mandatory law. And now what we've seen in just the few um, months, frankly, since it's passed, is more and more and more interest at, at, among the states collectively to deal with this. That um, we're not going to spend today talking about the federal government, are we? Maybe we will. <laughs> right. Uh, this is where it's going to be hard for Dan and I to have a lot of disagreement, probably, but there's a vacuum obviously at the federal level in dealing with global warming on any serious level. I'm a state appointee. I'm allowed to say these things. Uh, and um, so what's really becoming um, uh, increasingly sort of day by day by day is states are stepping up to the task and local governments are stepping up. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, and EE was just shorthand for energy efficiency, but in the um, uh, work that's being done for how we're going to implement this um, major new law in California, energy efficiency, the, the demand side of how do we work more efficiently, is looking to account for up to 23% of the reductions. And so it's one of the huge, huge areas that we're focusing on. For those of you who may want to get more information, we've put up the website here. It's a very easy website to remember, climatechange.ca.gov, and that's the website you can go to to find out what's going on in California. <laughs> Should we try changing the slide, or is that going to probably be on? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, this is a, a graphic representation. CEC stands for the California Energy Commission. It's one of our other state agencies. And if you just follow up on the right-hand side, you'll see what we call business as usual. If we didn't do anything to address global um, warming and uh, reducing our emissions. And then the bright um, green curve is where we need to go to get our emissions down to the night to the um, 1990 levels. 
So you can see it's, it's not an insignificant task to do it. But I've been looking at this an awful lot over the last couple of years, and I, for one, think that it is quite achievable to get our emissions down to the 2020 level without any significant disruption in the California economy. There are going to be major challenges, though. We've got to think about what to do in the transportation sector, and then we've got to really be starting now on how we're going to be getting our emissions down much, much further out past 2020. And that actually is going to be one of the biggest challenges. So uh, this is my personal view of what I think it's, it takes to get where we need to go. I think integration. We've got to be thinking of ways that we're going to be looking at bringing activities, bringing solutions, bringing players together, and integrating in a way that we normally don't do. The second thing is innovation, that we have a lot of the technology we need now. We're not necessarily using it, but we're going to have to develop more technology. And that's really going to count, call for innovation and thinking, frankly, outside of the box. And then the last one is collaboration. I work for a state agency, and I can say in my experience of the three years of being a commissioner, it's, it's very easy to just think inside your own, what I call your silo, and what you're, you're doing. And if we're really going to address global warming, we have to, all of us, step outside of whatever is the normal group that we operate, the normal way that we operate, and think, who else do we need to start to be working with? because these are calling for bigger solutions, more comprehensive solutions than we've done before. And that's what it's really going to take, I believe, to address global warming. I'm going to now go into just an example of three of the areas where my agency right now in real try time is trying to use these principles in a way that's very significant to address global warming. As I said, um, I the, have the great honor, the great fun to be the lead commissioner on energy efficiency. I gave you the figure a moment ago. Right now, the utilities in California are spending a billion dollars a year on energy efficiency. So what happened was that over the last few months, I and many, many people started to think, well, if you took a billion dollars a year and you looked at it over 10 years, that's $10 billion. That's a huge amount of money, frankly. What are we trying to do with that money? And so what has happened is that in a major decision that we actually just adopted um, a week ago, we have set out for California three major goals of where we're going to go in energy efficiency in order to address climate change. And it's taking, as I said, this already existing pot of money, but it's thinking about how can we work to integrate solutions in a way we've not done? How can we think about being more innovative in ways we haven't done? And how can we work more collaboratively to achieve what we want to achieve? So real quickly, the three goals, and we came up with the name, we call them the Big Bold Energy Efficiency Strategies, is the first one is to have all new housing built in California by the year 2020 to be zero net energy use. And I thought when I first heard about this, oh, wow, we are going to be just so far in the forefront of this. I um, did a trip to Europe this summer to meet with some of the key players in Europe on energy efficiency. And lo and behold, we found out that the UK has adopted as its formal energy efficiency action plan a goal to get all of the new homes in the UK built to be zero net energy usage by 2016. And so part of what we said was, well, okay, we could surely do it four years later. But what we're now embarked upon is a major effort working with the Energy Commission, which sets the state's building standards, working with the private sector, working with architects, working with the financial community, um, to look at how really could we completely change the housing market. The second one that we've chosen is on commercial new construction. 
and for this our formal goal now is going to see if we can have all new commercial construction in California be zero net energy usage by 2030. And we chose this one because this is part of, frankly, a national movement that's going on to see if we can really change how large office buildings, small buildings are being built in the commercial sector. Let me now move into the third and final one, which, is, um, which we call HVAC, which is heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Here in California, around the country, internationally, air conditioning is being used way beyond what it was used 10 years, 20 years, certainly 30 years ago. And especially with global warming, we're anticipating a greater use of air conditioning. So it becomes one of the major things that you have to start thinking about and just dramatically change what's going to be the efficiency of all this air conditioning that's being done. I'll just stop by saying that one of the, the la, sorry, yeah, the last slide. Um, when we think about global warming at my agency and so many of the people that I deal with, is it's really something that needs to be thought of locally, nationally, and internationally. Everybody here in this room can be doing something about your carbon footprint to decrease it. Every one of you can be thinking about how are you interacting with other people in really trying to take every step you can to be addressing global warming. All of us have a role to play on getting the federal government to start to get serious about global warming because while we can do a lot at the state level, a lot at the local level, we really do need to have our national government saying this is a top priority. And then internationally, one of the reasons why we chose these three big bold strategies was there's a huge amount of building going on in China. There's a huge amount of building going on in India. And if we can really be putting a lot of California resources to change how new construction is being done, that is something that we are simultaneously going to be working with China, working with India, because they've also got to be able to be changing how they're doing their building practices. So with that, I'll stop. And that's just a little bit of background on um, both what I think about, what my agency does, and some of the steps we're taking to try to address global warming. So Dan, now, do I get up there and do the same thing? I'll or just stop there here and do it. That's fine. You can use the same slides and just give a different talk. We could try that. <laughs> do that, since those are, those are such great slides. Um, well, I'm going to essentially tell a version of the same story because this, is, I think, is the story of the day. And I think one of the interesting things to, to highlight <laughs> when talking about what's going on right now is the really critical degree that we always talk about what's the, what's the moment when there's a tipping point? What's the moment when things change? And right now is that point in time when things that we're doing are going to make those tips happen. And I, I mean that in two different ways. One is that the world we're going to live in climate-wise is going to be different in 2050. We have passed one tipping point at least because the world will not be the same. We've already committed ourselves to warming that's going to change some aspects of the planet. And when people talk about tipping points, they talk about things when the world radically changes state. One of those is that if we don't cut down the emissions of fossil fuels, we know not from climate models or forecasts, but we know from just basic ocean chemistry. Probably I don't need these doubled up, right? Um, is that fine? OK. Um, we know from basic chemistry that there will be no more tropical corals by about 2050 if we don't change what's going on. And the reason has nothing to do with fancy models or forecasts or debates between reasonable, sometimes unreasonable climate skeptics. They have to do with the fact that the more carbon dioxide in the air forces more into the water, called Henry's Law. It's not fancy. It's been known for several hundred years. And the more carbon dioxide, greenhouse gas, we put in the air means there will be more in the water. And corals only grow over a very small range of having carbon in the water, which they can then take in to make, the, make, make their shells. So we're committed to a certain amount of warming. Where we tip into worlds that are dramatically different is the frightening part of the story that I'm actually also, like Dan, not going to dwell on. If, if there's questions, we can talk about it. But 
we are committed to some level of change. And the real question is, what level of change is one that's not going to make the world indistinguishable, totally different from today? All of the, what you're hearing about what's going on in California and in Japan and in Germany and in the UK and in Scandinavia and in places that are committed to act, not Washington, D.C., are all places that are trying to prevent those bigger changes. And one of the things we have to think about is this. This is a coal depot, and half of our electricity in the United States comes from coal. Two-thirds electricity in China comes from coal. And between the US, China, and India, we're going to spend, unless we get off that business as usual path that Diane mentioned, we're going to spend a trillion dollars on coal power plants in about the next 15 years. If we do that, we will tip. There is no scientific question that the world will be dramatically different. And of course, getting people off something which is cheap and abundant, and once you build a coal plant, it's with you for five decades. No one wants to disassemble, take apart a plant <laughs> that they've paid for and they're counting on the, the earnings from. And so even some of the ideas about what to do with this, there is a way to capture the carbon coming out of a smokestack. It's called carbon capture and storage. Exciting name. It is something that we could potentially do. It does not happen to be one of the things I think personally is going to be a big part of the solution for reasons I'll leave, but it's something we could do. But the thing I want to highlight is that while the world has some 600 years of coal left if we don't stop burning the stuff, the world we're in right now of high energy prices which opens the door for Diane's programs on efficiency and for solar. And who has solar on their rooftop? That's pretty good. We're the best part of the country for it. More of you should, for reasons that we'll leave and talk about later on. Everyone who cares about their bank account should have an energy efficiency audit done of their home. And unless you live in, you know, unless you live in an unusual sitting, setting, should have solar as part of your diet as well, for reasons we'll, we'll, we'll get to as we go. But the problem is that high energy prices open the door for things like solar and energy efficiency. But they open the door much more for more coal. And I want to explain that for more fossil fuels. Coal is cheap and abundant. So if our energy prices stay high, even with a quite a hefty tax, which we might or might not adopt, nationally to have us pay for some of the damages, we are going to find ways to do all kinds of ugly things with coal. And coal is not the only ugly thing out there. This is a strip mine in Alberta. This is not coal strip mining. This is strip mining for tar sands. It's basically oil in a solid form. It's very Canadian. It's because they have a hockey puck. When you go there and visit, this is in the Fort McMurray part of, of, of Canada, see this green stuff here? So I was flying over talking to the pilot, and he calls the green stuff, he doesn't call it grass, he calls it the overburden. That's what you get rid of uh, to get at all the tar sands underneath. And this tar sand is mixed with so much sulfur and, and impurity, and this is so far from anywhere where most of us would want to live. Apologies for any northern Albertans in the room that the piles of sulfur are this big. And that's not a lake. That's the settling pond for all of the junk, the, the mercury, the arsenic, the, all kinds of stuff that comes out. These are the piles of sulfur they're piling up because they have so much of it. And these are pretty, that's interesting, these are pretty big piles. The reason why I highlight this is that there's more oil in Alberta in this tar sands form then there is oil in Saudi Arabia. And there's more tar sands in Venezuela than there is oil in Saudi Arabia. So if you think that running down a little bit on our oil supply is going to usher in renewables, you're wrong. It's going to usher in a few nice new solar and wind technologies and some more energy audits because there's a business market there. But we're going to usher in much more fossil fuel. So high prices alone actually buy us more carbon than solutions unless things like California and like thinking states and nations really act. And that's why the tipping point we're at right now, I think, is much more important on the political and the scientific side around solutions than it is around that 
changed world that we're likely to be in. Now, I'm going to do a couple slides real quick because Diane did a version of them. This is total U.S., the whole country's carbon emissions. These are in billions of tons of carbon. We're about a quarter of the world's carbon emissions. We lost the mantle a few months ago of being the world's biggest emitter. China has now taken that over. But on a per-person basis, we are the worst if you exclude those few Canadians to the north of us. This is the path that we're going to be on. It's like that business-as-usual path that Diane showed for California. And now I'm going to do a bit of California grandstanding that I can do, but Diane probably shouldn't do. It's a little bit rude. If Governor Schwarzenegger was President Schwarzenegger, which he may want to be, but we'll leave that for a different story, I'm going to scale to the size of the whole nation that AB32 law that Diane mentioned. This is the path that if the whole country adopted California's law, that's AB32, and that's the next thing the governor has talk, talked about, again, if we scaled up from California to the nation. So this would happen in President Schwarzenegger's 12th term. <laughs> okay, Diane mentioned energy efficiency, and everyone should do an efficiency audit. And the challenge that I give my students is that if you go home and install more efficient light bulbs at a reasonable fraction, not just one bulb, but a reasonable fraction in your apartment or home, and don't see a difference on your energy bill, send me an email. Because you literally will. Efficient bulbs, these compact fluorescents, can save 75% or more on the energy use of an incandescent bulb. And by the way, an incandescent light bulb, like some of these, that's not a good bulb. Um, for some of these things here, these are not light sources. These are heat sources that generate a little bit of light as a byproduct. It's a crazy way to light your room. These things are much more efficient. And the next generation of efficient bulbs called light-emitting diodes. Some of you might have the solid-state lighting for like your keychains on your flashlights and stuff or your, 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 um, your car keys. Those are even more efficient still. But we won't get to those in any large numbers unless we get this first wave to happen. And the rebates you can get by doing better lighting and better water heaters and doing home energy audits are amazing. They save you lots of money because it's in the state's interest and the utility's interest and your interest to adopt these things. And unless we make energy efficiency part of the standard conversation, we will not get to a more dramatic set of solutions. And we know it works. This is electricity use in the United States over the last 50 years. This is in California. And this is in New York. And you can see that after the oil crisis in the 70s, California sort of got religion on this and has, has held the line. Energy use per person has not changed in decades. That's due to the programs Diane talked about. The rest of the country went up like this. And yes, I do have a red state, blue state graph, which I won't show you, but it's not pretty. <laughs> this amount of savings, if all of the US states were as efficient as the best few on this metric, that would be more energy than we import from everywhere outside of North America. Everywhere. And imagine what that changes in terms of balance of payments, paying for jobs overseas. It's a remarkable change, and it's not something that requires a turn down in lifestyle. I happen to think that our life is at least as good as that in Mississippi, shall we say. <laughs> and there are new programs to start thinking about how to do the same thing to zero your carbon footprint of your energy bill, as Diane mentioned, as the programs that are in place now for energy efficiency. These are now voluntary. And on your bill, you can find a box to click if you want to join Climate Smart. And for about 5 bucks a month, you can basically have PG&E find ways to zero your bill. So there are options now emerging that allow these kinds of things to happen. And we're not alone, thankfully. The states in red on this map are all states that, like California, have adopted different levels of clean energy in their mix. Now, California, for example, has said that by 2010, we plan to have 20% of our energy from renewable sources, from very low or no carbon sources like solar, wind, biofuels. We exclude nuclear from that and large hydro that we might want to talk about later. These other states are our fellow travelers. And some of them are very aggressive. New York is very aggressive. They, however, 
include large hydro. So if you're a Cree Indian in Ottawa, you're not happy. But on a carbon basis, they're, they're a partner in this kind of move, moving ahead. And by the way, Texas really started this by noting under then Governor Bush that installing more wind energy was faster and cheaper and allowed you to place it where you needed it in a matter of months, whereas it takes years to site other power plants. And so there are some real advantages, even if you are a climate naysayer to going green, or in this map, red. But notice there are some real problems. Diane mentioned the need for federal action. There's clearly a small problem in the southeast, to say the least. And even though we have more than half of the states having now adopted these standards, the standards all vary, which is not a problem. Madison thought the states were the laboratory of democracy, and that this is a version of that. But there are interstate trading opportunities that are lost because we have some states that are in and some states that are out. And one of our state congressmen, um, Henry Waxman, is essentially at war with EPA Administrator Johnson over Johnson's ignoring the recent Supreme Court Act, the Massachusetts versus the EPA, that requires us to regulate CO2. And he has just licensed, EPA and Mr. Johnson has, new coal-fired power plants for Utah without even considering the other options. Even President, Governor, President, Governor Bush discovered that wind was cheaper than the natural gas plants he wanted to build. So a little bit of normal reading the literature and conversation would go a long way, but Washington is insulated from many of us in some very bizarre ways. I'm going to do one technical thing for just a minute or two, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop. And that is, the vehicles are a critical part of the story as well. And if you just look at the red bar, this just shows you in units that only if you're really a nerd like me would you want to discuss, how much greenhouse gases are involved in, move, in, in a gallon of gasoline. And this bar for gasoline, about 80% of it is emissions you get by driving the car. And then the top little bit, the top 20%, is the emissions you get by running the machines that bring oil to us and refine it and transport it. In other words, most of this is what we call on-road emissions. And then there's the refining part. In this country, we have an alternate energy strategy which essentially says President Bush now loves President Lula of Brazil because they produce sugarcane ethanol and suddenly we love alternate fuels because we have an alternate fuel mandate, a requirement. But look what this graph says. This says that if you make liquid fuel from coal, that's something we know how to do. There are companies that do it today. It is almost twice as ugly as gasoline is. And remember I said there's all this coal out there, and there's all that tar sands out there, and there's all this other stuff out there that if we don't find ways to limit them with regulation or good behavior on our part, we're going to burn a lot more of this stuff than clean stuff. Now, if you make ethanol from corn, as the U.S. has decided to do a lot of, and your ethanol distillery run, is run by coal, which many of them are, you get a, a very annoying little box in your way, which maybe is being sent by the EPA. <laughs> That's from Microsoft. Well, actually, it's, it's, our, it's our network system here. Ethanol made from corn in a distillery run by coal is basically as bad as gasoline, if not worse, if the plant's not that efficient. However, ethanol made from cellulosic materials, stuff like this desk, if this is in fact real wood, not fake real wood, it's hard to tell, is dramatically better. But of the 120 new ethanol distilleries being built in this country right now because of a huge subsidy we give for turning corn into ethanol, out of the 120, 116, 114 do this process. And four or six, depending on how you count, do this. And there are even some ways to get to negatives if you can find ways to grow plants that are so-called green cellulosic plants. And we will likely do much more of this nationwide instead of this, except for thankfully in California, where part of this AB 32 and a, and a law passed previously um, by the same 
a, a member of the assembly, I think a real hero of the planet named Fran Pavley. She's basically required that we develop more of these. And this isn't it. We have a low-carbon standard for fuel, which says, this is what we do right now in California. Actually, we're a little better because we mix ethanol in. But by 2020, we want to be at least this much better, and we will keep regulating this down. And other states and presidential candidates, both Democrat and Republican, have already adopted this thing with the very nerdy name, a low-carbon fuel standard, as one of their campaign platforms. And green biofuels aren't the only way to get there. Another way to get the, whoa. <laughs> Another way to get there is to note that in states like California, where our electricity is relatively green, you could actually charge up with plug-in hybrid cars, as some of you may have seen or driven or maybe one or few even owns. And this is a way to use our green electricity, particularly the electricity we generate at night, whose value is very low because the demand is low. Electricity generated at 4 in the morning has a value that often goes almost exactly to zero in value because many of the generators can't turn their power plants down. If there's wind blowing, if your nuclear plant is operating, you really can't turn it down at night. So electricity at 4 in the morning, when you might be charging up your car because hopefully you're asleep, unless you have a teenage son or daughter, in which case, who knows what you're doing. Um, <laughs> is a way to use that nighttime power. And California, which does have a great wind resource, has a wind resource that's actually better at night than during the day. That means that without means like this, either to store power in big batteries or to charge up lots of our plug-in hybrid cars, these are things we won't build those wind turbines because we don't need that wind power as much at night as during the day. So without that extra demand at nighttime, we won't build that extra clean capacity. So there's lots of things like this that we need to do, and there's lots of ways that we need to partner with other states and other countries to make this sort of thing happen. And I think the most sobering tipping point for me is the degree to which, while California is doing all, lots of neat stuff, and this AB 32 and the governor's low carbon fuel standard and the big bold initiatives on efficiency are all really important. If California doesn't basically get joined by one big state or country at least every year for the next 50 years, we won't make it. We will have no tropical corals. We will have lots of that tar sands being used. And so we're, we're going to have to not only do this at home, but it's going to have to be exported. Now, there is a weak climate bill at the federal level. It's called the Lieberman-Warner bill. And it's basically a very, very light beer version of California's AB 32. But light beer is better than no beer. It's football Sunday, so maybe any beer is good. <laughs> but we're going to need to have those things get adopted to at least start the process, because we're so far from doing anything at the federal level because of seven years of absolute inactivity and, in fact, hostility to the science of not only climate change, but lots of other important science. We're going to have to turn that around, too. And the only way to do that is for places to look at some, some states, some countries, that haven't just passed the law. Because California's passed the law, but our emissions have not come down yet. So we're going to have to make good on all these promises and document and export that if we really want to turn these tipping points around. Very good. OK. Prepare to take take stand, a stance at the microphone. <laughs> we <Forget> that stage. <laughs> <laughs> we're happy to ask each other some as well. If you guys don't, Dan, but we'll... what do you really think about climate change? Gee, I don't know. It's, um, I think we should study the problem for a few more decades. <laughs> Let's start at the, the closest microphone, please. Um, I was just curious as to what the uh, mechanics of a state interacting with another country like China is, given that we don't have embassies as a state in China. Um, we are actually, my agency has a formal memorandum of understanding with Jiangsu province, where Shanghai is, which has a lot of new, a lot of coal plants being built and a lot of the emissions. So 
we actually have and are able to legally um, enter into working arrangements with other countries, other provinces, and other states. That before I became a commissioner, I actually had this concept of somehow there was a prohibition <laughs> on local government or state government or people working with entities outside of the United States, that it all had to be done under some massive federal umbrella. And that's actually not true. And so we have a number of direct relationships with this, as I said, the, um, uh, the new homes, um, the UK and its formal governmental agencies are already now we're starting out the mechanics of how do we work together. So there's a huge amount that does happen to have to happen at the federal level, but even before that, we are going full speed ahead on exchanging information, um, having technical people talk to one another, hosting people from China coming here, hosting people from the California going to China to do a lot of the um, work that needs to be done now. In fact, one part of that process is that the standards, one of California's big success stories that led into what Diane described are the efficiency standards for building, so-called Title 24 in California, have been world leading year after year after year in terms of what they require for better lighting, these better heating and ventilation systems, for air exchanges, for materials, all kinds of stuff. Those standards have been one of the most active forms of international collaboration way before the federal government got interested at all. Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, Stanford, UCLA have all been critical in developing parts of those things. And those have been exported initially informally and then often codified on the other end so that right now many U.S. cars cannot be exported to China because our cars don't meet their air quality standards. And that message sometimes f uh, f uh, filters back to Washington. It filters back to Sacramento and, and San Francisco, great. But it doesn't seem to often get across the Rockies. So, <laughs> Please, up top. I agree that uh, all of the things you've talked about are desirable and we should be pursuing them. But I'd appreciate your comments on three small points. I've heard the term solar dimming. And I'm wondering what that is and, and how that relates to this issue, if it does. Uh, secondly, it seems like much of the problem with global warming is the fact that we're simply going to change our environment. But isn't it true that some areas of the world may benefit from global warming? As an example, the western United States during the dinosaur days was lush forests and lots of water, and the CO2 content, I understand, was considerably higher than it was today. So isn't it just the change in environment that, that is causing the problem? And lastly, and the one that I'm most interested in, is that you seem to uh, recognize that we're going to have some amount of global warming no matter what we do. So shouldn't there be more uh, discussion and research on adapting to what is inevitable in terms of adapting agriculture or not building uh, below sea level and, and things of that sort? Well, I'll try. I mean, there's a lot in there. I'll try to go through them in order. Um, global dimming is something that hopefully many of you saw. There was a recent Nova show about it. It was quite well done. Global dimming has to do with a problem that actually means climate change is even worse than we think. Without going into the details, global dimming so is the solar observation. Dimming. Solar, solar, dimming. Dimming. Solar, dimming. solar dimming. Sorry. Solar dimming is the fact that we observe that there is less insulation reaching the surface, less sunlight reaching the surface than we would have thought. And this, has to, this was studied by people putting out dishes of water. The test you do is called pan evaporation, and that's what it means. You put out a pan of water, and you observe the evaporation rate. And what is happening is that the world is moister than it was expected to be. And there's a variety of scientific arguments for why this has happened. It's largely due to a somewhat hotter and a more deforested world, trees are really good at keeping moisture around, means that the world is losing its ability to keep a lot of moisture at the surface. 
a lot of that water vapor is higher up in the air now. So what we're seeing actually is that more sunlight than we would have thought is being trapped by water vapor high in the sky. What that means, however, is that this process is only short term. And what it means is that while we're only seeing a certain amount of warming so far, there's a lot of other warming being masked by this. And so this process will slow down when we stop cutting our trees down. And what we're going to see then is a jumping up of warming because a lot of warming that is happening is being masked from us. So global dimming, uh, solar dimming is in fact a problem that is short term and it's going to make the climate story worse. The next one was the, uh, the, the, the changes in different places may be beneficial. A frequent story is, well, look, with global warming, we're going to grow more crops in the Canadian Rockies areas and in Siberia. Well, the problem is that our world and our economy is incredibly well adapted to the climate of today. And it is true that 75 million years ago, the climate was different. And if our climate had 75 million years to adjust to the changes we are wreaking upon it, we might discover there are parts of the world that are better. But for example, as the world warms, one of the first big things to happen is that the amount of permafrost, all that frozen peat in all of the northern part of the world, is going to start giving off greenhouse gases. And that effect alone is going to, sw is going to dwarf any of these positive changes. Because that's going to make a strong feedback for more warming equals more warming still. And since we are adapted to live in the world we're in now, not the world that might evolve in 75 million years, it's literally the case that trees would have to become ants to literally walk south or walk north <laughs> fast enough to catch up. And that's largely because we're adapted to this world. So the last question was the adaptation. And you're right. What we've largely talked about was what we call the mitigation, removing our need to emit more carbon later so that the world won't be so dissimilar. There are lots of things that we're doing in California and elsewhere also focused on the adaptation story. To some people, adaptation feels like giving up. We can't do it. But in almost every case, it's a mix. So for example, is it adaptation or mitigation to say there are some biofuels that we might be able to develop that we'll be able to grow in a drier climate or a more variable climate that are good for food and good for fuel and good for, for fuel production that don't, for example, make Mexican farmers starve as we generate more ethanol from corn. That's a mix. That's adapting so we don't have to use gasoline. That's, that's mitigating by not having to use gasoline, but it's also adapting by developing crops that will, in fact, be more tolerant in the world that we're going to see. Because we're committed to at least two degrees of temperature change, at minimum. That's going to happen no matter what we do, unless tomorrow we discover, not only we discover cold fusion, but we also discover cold storage, where somehow we have a device that can suck carbon out of the air. We would have to have both of those happen for us to think about a world without at least two degrees of temperature change. So it's not good. OK. Um, I just would like to ask mm -hmm. the possibly President Schwarzenegger, where is he still driving a Hummer? <laughs> And then uh, my second question is, <laughs> I have read sometime last month that they have um, a model of a hydrogen, um, you know, a car, a hydrogen car. But the coverage of that piece of um, a news in the papers was not very well covered in the, on the TV. And so I'm still wondering, what is the relationship of the oil companies and all of those um, with the production of the really efficient cars. Okay. Um, I'll just, of course, take the fifth that. <laughs> no way can I speak for, uh, uh, with the governor, with, with the Hummer. But I w will say that he is an absolute believer in global warming and needing to address it. But perhaps all of us you know, can look at some aspect of our lifestyle. And besides, my Hummers now run on a hydrogen and biofuel. No, only I think five, I think two out of the five. 
so I, you know, I won't, probably Dan can talk more about the, the hydrogen and the cars. Let me just say my personal thought is in a lot of this, and you bring up, you know, the hydrogen economy and hydrogen cars, um, there's a range of tools that we're going to have available to deal with things. And my personal belief is that we have to, in some ways, have a balance so that we don't get too caught up with, here's the magic solution over here, and this is what we've just all got to put all of our effort into. We may need to do it to get to the 2050 levels where we dramatically change what we're going to be doing for, for transportation. And this is, of course, one of the huge things that, that worries Dan and I and many, many others is that in adequately dealing with global warming, we're going to have to balance addressing so many issues so fast that are so complex and so interrelated that we've got to figure out what are the technologies that we have right now, you know, getting everybody in this room motivated to go home and instead of just having one or two compact fluorescent lights, your average house has 32 fixtures. We need to dramatically bring that up that we had an average of eight in your house or whatever. You know, and, and it's not like we need to have somebody invent the CFL. Um, those are available at any store practically you walk into. How do we get the stuff we know now being used? How do we simultaneously figure out dramatic changes in our what we're doing for transportation, everything else, so that we can get the 2050? And then how do we think about adaptation and all the steps we need to be doing now to be addressing the adaptation? And, and that's fundamentally a um, something we've never as a state, as a country, as a world have to deal with. How you put together the near term, the mid term, the long term, and all these interrelating issues. Yeah. And so I'll, I'll stay on the hydrogen point because hydrogen is likely to be a useful part of the equation. But just like that graph I showed for the low carbon fuel standard that showed different, fuel, different fuels that were, some were worse than gasoline, and let's, let's hope we can exclude those, which is going to be hard, but we can do that. Then we have those better ones. And it's not only the liquid fuels, but it's also those plug-in hybrids. For the foreseeable future, a regular hybrid or a plug-in hybrid is going to be significantly better than a fuel cell car. One, a fuel cell car today costs about a million dollars per car. That's a little expensive for most of us. <laughs> Maybe not the governor, but for most of us it's expensive. Um, but the problem is that it's not just that the car is expensive. Right now, most of our hydrogen comes from taking natural gas and pulling off. Natural gas is CH4, carbon four hydrogens, and pulling off the hydrogens and putting it in your car. That process is only a little bit better than just running an efficient Volkswagen diesel, for example. And so unless our hydrogen is green, meaning generated by solar, wind, or what I think will be the big, big winners 30 years from now. Everyone has a little composting tank at home where you, where you, have, where you have microbes making your hydrogen and you basically fill up by plugging that in overnight. Your, your microbes are chomping on bread and leftover sushi and whatever. That's a process where I could see in 30 years us doing a lot of. But, but for the very long future, efficient regular cars and certainly plug-in hybrids are massively better. And the problem is the policy debate doesn't work that way. The policy debate and the things that get people elected and get people their names on bills is I'm the promoter of the hydrogen something. As opposed to saying the much more boring but useful statement, I believe we should let a thousand green flowers bloom and hydrogen will be one of them, but there's also plug-in hybrids and this and that. That doesn't really sell. And that's why what the governor has done in supporting AB 32 and in the vehicle bills is so profoundly important because it doesn't pick winners. And people in Congress and Senate like to pick winners, not because they personally do, because that's how notoriety and bills and money happens. So what California is doing is this much more complicated sort of portfolio approach. And that's what we're going to need. But that doesn't sell unless all of us make it happen. California has now passed 
legislation that if we do it, we will literally save the system. But we have to have all of our personal decisions reflecting it to some degree. Doesn't mean we should all go out and buy a million dollar um, fuel cell car, but it does mean that if everyone's decisions on the vehicles they buy, whether they do the energy efficiency retrofits, whether they install solar, if those decisions can get it influenced, then, the, then this nice paperwork we have becomes something real, and that's the hard part right now. Let's go to the upper mic, please. Yeah, I have two questions. One is, the Bush administration has, I mean, just this week, they're, they rewrote a report on global warming and the health consequences. They've, they continue on this path, and my basic question is, what is, what is the damage they've done, and what will it take to undo it? My second question is sort of off Diane's last comments, where you essentially said, this is really complicated to deal with, <laughs> and, and really asked a question, so I'm sort of asking it back. Are people thinking about what it'll really take to get to this 2050 level in a serious way? So those are my questions. Um. Remind me again what your first one was, other than what came to mind was um, the election next November is what it'll take. <laughs> and how much damage has been done, huge damage. But, you know, we all have to get up in the morning and put one foot in front of another and move ahead. Um, are we thinking about 2050 seriously? I, I, I don't think so. Um, there's sort of at my level of the decision maker, policy makers around the state and who we're interacting with with other states and who we're interacting with internationally, frankly, is geared a whole lot to 2020, just because those are a lot of fundamental changes. But one of the reasons why we've picked these big, bold steps in energy efficiency and the new commercial construction out to 2030 is that at least starts us in a major way on getting past even the 10-year horizon out to 2050. But in some ways, I mean, one of the things that I've been thinking about is, and I echo what Dan said about everybody should go on the website and get your carbon footprint. Um, there's, you know, 10 or 15 wonderful, reputable sites out there for where you can track it. And um, once we get, which we will in the next year, we're, we're probably going to do it under the auspices of our energy efficiency website, if nothing else, the California carbon footprint, um, I actually want to make sure that there's a 2050 footprint that you have to go to that just says pro rata if we needed to get down to where we know we need to by 2050, what would people's footprint start to look like? So you could, so on a, you know, on a real individual concrete basis, you could start to see what a lifestyle needs to look like. So two bits. One is that there are a lot of, I mean, if you do a Google search for carbon footprint, you'll find a bunch. There's one that we built at UC Berkeley for citizens to use. It's under my laboratory with that thing called Rail. But the easier way is, it's just carbonneutral.org. No www, just carbonneutral.org will get you there. And you put in your vehicle type, and you put in how much you drive, and it tells you what, 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 your, what your car is. Like we're working with the other key state agency that we haven't actually mentioned by name yet called CARB, the California Air Resources Board. They're actually the lead agency on the AB32 process. And what CARB has done is to ask our laboratory at Berkeley to develop the footprint calculator so that every city in the state could use it. There's already a calculator for your home that Lawrence Berkeley Lab runs. It's called um, Smart Homes or Energy. It's called Smart Homes, yeah. And that's an LBL website, and ours is supposed to be for what individuals or what businesses do. And what CARB has, has done is something I think very clever, and that's to say that if everyone goes out and builds their own calculator, we're going to be discussing the numbers ad infinitum. And if, if, El Mo if the city of El Monte and the city of El Cerrito want their own and they go out and they hire it privately, they can do that, but the numbers will never agree. So what the state is considering taking on is they will provide a standardized calculator, likely an evolution of the one that's on that carbon neutral site, and that every city that wants one will say, this is the state-sponsored site. Here are the numbers. We will vet the numbers. You can use them. 
And so let me just highlight you know, this, the, the issue of this 2050 target. What 2050 will mean if we're 80% down on carbon emissions, not from what the level would have been then, but 80% down to 1990 level. You're, you're, you're saying is dropped down. Oh, yes. I got just too excited. Um, that will basically mean that every coal plant has been closed and replaced with a no-carbon energy plant. It will mean that everyone in the room is driving a plug-in hybrid plus, plus, plus that might be a fuel cell car. It means that we will use mass transit more, and that will be powered by renewables. And it means we will stop deforestation. That's a bit of a menu. But remember, six years ago, California was bleeding money due to an energy crisis, and the utilities were one of the most hated agencies in the state after various Texas energy companies. Five years later, six years later, California's utilities are leading the world in cleaning these things up. Now, they might be not doing everything they could do. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, there's a few issues there. But, but. <laughs> six years, things are dramatically different. Now, most of what's happened in the last six years is really nice talk. Great talk. Talk we have to have. But doing these things is going to require this whole other level. And as much as these curves look nice, and we can talk about what will go into them, we haven't done anything to cut emissions. A few places, like California, have kept them level per person, but we're adding a lot of people, so we're rising. No one has done it because of carbon. Yes, France is almost all nuclear, and so their carbon level is low. And yes, Iceland is poised to be a low-carbon economy. But they didn't do it because they looked at the cost. They did it because it was strategically or politically or they had an abundant, wonderful natural resource right there waiting to say, please use me. So no one has actually done this based on a recognition about carbon. And so making good on all these promises is something that we have not even tried. Remember, there's no price for carbon yet. Well, as much as my, the analysis in my lab and my friend's labs indicate that there are lots of so-called low-hanging fruit, things we can do at very low cost, maybe negative cost, but we're not doing them globally, and there are some things they're going to cost. And people will back up pretty quickly when they start to see higher prices for some of the things they do because we have a real aversion to doing those things. So the challenge is immense. Um, I used to work for the Department of Energy, and one of the things I was involved in... I'm sorry in, for you. <laughs> <laughs> actually, um, uh, was um, laser isotope separation. We were looking at the cost of making uh, uranium for uh, bombs at the time. We've invested a huge amount of energy in making a lot of bombs. Um, and there was some sort of a bill a while back that said, well, let's, let's take those bombs and convert them back into useful fuel. But they had to be some sort of thing. It had to be cost effective. Yeah. Absurd, absurdity of the time, and it seems to me we have we have a, a twofer here we could win on. Um, and so the question is um, uh, nuclear power, but the other question is uh, fusion power, uh, which has a lot more promise and a lot less of the downside. So if you can comment on that. And actually a third question, lithium-ion batteries, someone said to the effect that, that they're actually, if you mass produce them, they're cheaper than lead acid. I don't know about that. I was just at a conversation on the the Washington Mall a week ago with the solar energy stuff. But they said, you know, lithium it basically isn't all that expensive if you do mass producing, and that would make the that hybrid car a lot more efficient. So if you can comment on those, I'd appreciate but it. But let me start off with nuclear. That 30 years ago when I first started in energy in California, the legislature passed a law that prohibits new nuclear power plants in California until there's a permanent repository for high-level radioactive waste. And this, interestingly, um, that law was upheld by the United States Supreme Court on a unanimous vote. And the reason why the law was put in place was it was viewed that nuclear power is quite a risky deal for the ratepayers that ultimately pay for the power plants because we don't have a permanent a repository for high-level waste. And we're no closer 30 years later on solving that issue than um, we were three decades 
ago. So as a practical matter here in California, there is a law um, that has been put in place. There is increasing interest, obviously, we hear about in the paper on nuclear power. Nuclear power is heavily, heavily subsidized. It would not stand on its own right now if it weren't so heavily subsidized. And the question that I come back to is if you're going to put in billions of dollars of federal subsidies into uh, basically power sources, um, is nuclear really the one that you put at the top of the list, given a whole host of issues that, res that um, surround it? So one of the things when you're having the debates about nuclear is to remember whatever is seen as the cost of nuclear has embedded within its subsidies that are unlike any other industry. And that if we didn't, as a policy matter, have those subsidies, it's not economic. Um, the second thing that I will say is, again, having lived through the years in California when the utilities were building Diablo Canyon and songs and with my work around the country, is that it is a utility who builds a power plant. And nuclear power plants are several billion dollars, and the last new one built in the United States was built over 30 years ago, if I'm right. At Watts Bar, yeah. So it's a lot of technology risks, it's a lot of financial risks, and what it does is for a utility who's going to embark on building a new nuclear power plant, at least in the United States, is it's going to take a huge amount of senior level management attention focused on that one item. And what we need is we need utilities around the country who instead are thinking about how do they bring energy efficiency to their customers? How do they figure out using solar and wind? And these are the types of real trade-offs that, that happen that you, I just encourage people to think about when they talk about, oh, it's just, you know, let's sign up for these plants because of the carbon emissions are so low, is that it, there are win-lose activities that will go on. And one of my biggest concerns, because I've worked so closely and understood utility management is if you embark on doing new nuclear, you almost inevitably will then just not have the type of senior management time you need to have to embark upon these other activities that are cheaper and more reliable. Let me say a few words because I'm actually a professor of nuclear engineering and it's a complicated thing. First of all, there's no question, 10 years ago, whoops, when I would ask my students to so close your eyes and raise your hand, are you pro or anti-nuclear? 95% of them, not just here at Berkeley, but I taught at Princeton before this, would raise their hand, no, they're anti-nuclear. Now when you ask students to raise their hand, you get about 70% pro-nuclear of students. That's a pretty interesting and big change. So there is, a, there is a difference in the thinking about nuclear now than from a while ago, but let me highlight one of the issues that relates to this cost. New nuclear plants today cost between five and ten billion dollars a piece. And that's with an incredible range of subsidies. There are subsidies around direct costs, there are financing subsidies, there are licensing subsidies, there are subsidies over the risk of accidents. It is a subsidized, as Diane said, unlike any other technology. Now these subsidies might be a good bet. They might be a worthwhile set of things to do, but we have 103 nuclear power plants operating in the United States today. Every and that's a quarter of the world's total fleet, basically, a little bit less. Of those plants, every single one has to be retired over the next three decades. And many of them have been relicensed to extend their lives, et cetera. <coughs> those 100 plants contribute about 20% of our electricity. Okay? Now, the nuclear industry has done some remarkable things. The nuclear industry has built in the U.S. 25 new plants over the last 20 years without building a single one by operating the plants they have much more efficiently. So they have actually done some remarkable improvements in, in an industry that was for many years seen as really poorly managed, and I think there's some still evidence of that today on the licensing, et cetera, side. But let's say we did want nuclear to be part of the solution and we accepted the risks in a series of trade-offs, et cetera, which could happen. And California might even lift its ban on building them, although I suspect we're more likely 
to build nuclear plants in neighboring states, just the same way we burn coal burned elsewhere. We don't burn it in-state, we burn it out-of-state, although AB32 will put an end to that little piece of um, bad use of Excel, Excel spreadsheets. But 103 nuclear power plants. Every one has to be replaced over the next 35 years just to keep nuclear generating as much power as it does today. And remember, in 30, year, in 30 years, we're going to need a lot more power. So if we only replace those plants, nuclear's market, its share would fall. Even if we replace them, even if we could do that. We haven't built one since 1982, and I sit on several federal nuclear committees, and I am frequently the youngest person on it by a good 15 years. And that should worry you, because I ain't that young. The next part of it is that if you want nuclear to be a real player and to make that investment of 5 to $10 billion per plant worthwhile, You'd really want to, want to make nuclear more than 20%, but a growing more of that picture. My personal lab's analysis is we wouldn't want about 100 plants, but more like 300 plants. Well, well, what that means is that we would need to build one plant a month, starting yesterday for the next 30 years. Every nuclear engineer on the planet believes that's impossible. Not because of the money, but because of the need to ramp up skills that we no longer have. And to get the parts we would need, we would be competing with the other countries around the world who are building plants. So even if you thought nuclear was a bet you wanted to take on risk-wise and divert the attention of senior managers, as Diane said, it is going to be a really hard road to hoe for nuclear to be at that level. Possible, but it is a big issue. And so one example is, Diane mentioned these lose-lose or these lose-win trade-offs. Here's an example. Right, right now... Wind power and hydro are nice complements. Hydro stores energy. You can turn it on quickly when you need it. And wind, you can use it when it's on so they can balance each other. Natural gas and wind balance each other well. Nuclear does not. When you have a nuclear power plant, you do not want to cycle it up and down, running at a 92% now and 87% up and down. You can do it. But I guarantee your problems will be compounded. As someone who has looked at design issues and nuclear power plants, that's not how you want to operate them. The brain capacity to manage a big new nuclear industry is a really critical thing that Diane mentioned. And so if you wanted to think about a portfolio, nuclear often takes you out of portfolio thinking and, and thinking about this technology as a creature by itself. My suspicion is we will build more nuclear plants, and we will more than replace the 103 we have. But I don't believe, for all these reasons, that we're likely to be able, barring a big breakthrough, to be able to get nuclear a much larger share. And so that does suggest that there's a real set of issues, even if you decide to accept the risks and think that it's a good deal financially, et cetera. It's going to be a tough road to hoe. Another Wonderfest dialogue starts in just two or three minutes. Uh -oh. <laughs> we have time for one more question, but maybe if other questions exist, our speakers will be willing to step outside these doors and answer them there? I also have a request before the last question. Okay. Who is next? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know. Who is, who is at the mic first? I'm not sure. Uh, well, please hold on just sure. a second. Before you proceed, because Wonderfest is being recorded today, I must ask that not only our speakers need to sign waivers, which they have, but everyone who's asked a question, I would ask please to come down during the brief break and sign a quick waiver, please. Um, all right. Please go ahead. Uh, as well as an HVAC and civil engineer who broke his pick in the solar energy in, industry in 74, uh, um, the two comments on your presentation. First of all, the question of management. Um, I built a great number of solar water heaters, and it, they were lucrative. They made money. They could do it. But I finally realized that one of the things for management is there are no corner offices, a decentralized source of energy like a solar water heater, however efficient it may be socially uh, and maybe lucrative. It doesn't give you the kind of status that to, that it does to be in a large managing a very great hierarchy of engineers. And I, I think that's not a trivial to see a matter. It's not a matter only of profit. It's very difficult to... Plumbers often make more money than uh, nuclear engineers, and they don't have the same status. Um, and it's not a trivial matter. I, I, the only wonderful presentation, and of course, who could disagree that we should all, do all we can to mitigate, to do everything we can to follow this kind of pattern. 
I am troubled, however, that though you did address it a question or so back, the implication of many of your response to how are we going to adapt to the things that are going to happen no matter what, let's say your 2% minimum change, you Im implied that we wouldn't have to change our lives. Mm. I don't want to be a doomsday sayer, but I mean no. dramatically <laughs> we, different. We, we both yeah. believe there's going to be dramatic change. Yeah, I hope, I hope that wasn't the implication. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't think I was. I'm afraid the general public gets the impression that if we were all good guys and drove hybrids and we saved, reduced our carbon print, 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 we did all those things, we wouldn't 10 years from now be faced with the terrible problems of, of at least a sudden certain amount of sea level rise, a certain very large disruption in crop production. I, I think these are going to be socially disruptive on a tremendous scale. I, I don't want, you can dream up your own doomsday scenario about what might happen, but it seems to me the minimum is going to be pretty serious, uh, no matter what we do about making things better in 2050. And I, I you, you certainly know that, but uh, what are we going to do politically? It's going to be very difficult when all of a sudden there are disruptions that are not just a matter of, okay. of uh, inconvenience. And th this is maybe I didn't um, uh, say it as clearly as I could, is that when I talked before about the complexity of these interrelated issues and having to deal in real time with them, where we're going to be looking at um, mitigation and decreasing avoiding emissions, and we're going to have to be juggling the near-term solutions while we're really embarked upon the further-term solutions to dramatically change it. At the same time, we're going to be dealing with adaptation issues that I personally believe are going to have a social and political and economic turmoil on a level we've never seen. And, and it's, despite all of our wonderful internet tools, despite everything else we have, it is incredibly challenging, is maybe the best word I could even say, to think about can human brains deal with that adequately within the social structures that we have and the political structures? I mean, but as I always come back to at the end of the day, all we can do is do what we can right now. That's, that, to me, is our absolute moral imperative, is the more we do now, the easier we are going to make it for, our, you know, my children, grandchildren to deal with this. I mean, the world is going to be different. I tried to say that with that one example. It's going to be different in ways we don't even know now. I would say there's a very simple sort of calculus to think about, and that is for us to not just solve the problem, but to keep the world recognizable in 2050. Carbon will have to become as important a currency as money is today to everyone in this room and especially the younger people here. And it took a long time for money to become <laughs> the currency that money is today. It's going to have to happen for carbon on, an, on, a, on a time scale not of centuries, but of years and minutes, and we've never tried that before. Thank you for the good questions. <clears throat>